Good morning. I'm a little nervous. The last time I, I preached from this room, we preached on solitude, and we went into quarantine for six months. So I'll try to keep it under control this week. If you want the notes for the sermon, you can scan the QR code on your screen or, or up here behind me, uh, and, and that way you can take notes, you can follow along. Uh, in all seriousness, I, I'm very excited uh, to be with you all today. Uh, I, I love this room. I love uh, the people more that gather here. I love the worship. Another thing I get really excited about uh, is when I have an Amazon package coming in the mail. And I don't mean like cleaning supplies coming in the mail. I mean like something that I really want uh, coming in the mail. Uh, just the other week, uh, it was my birthday, and uh, I had, my brother uh, had gotten me an Amazon gift card, so I was waiting on something fun to come in the mail. And uh, I saw the Amazon truck pull up like a day early. I was like, oh yeah, it's here. And I'm like a little kid at the door, you know, waiting for the package there. Driver drops it off. It's Lysol wipes. That's not what I ordered. But in this day and age, Lysol wipes is kind of a find, right? Like, I'll take that. That's pretty good. So it's funny how much we love, we don't, how much we love waiting. We hate it. And I think it's getting worse in our society, how, how difficult it is to wait. Uh, the instantaneous nature of the world that we live in uh, makes it where waiting is a lot harder, I think, than it's ever been before. Are you, would you consider yourself to be impatient? Would you consider yourself to be quick to lose your patience? We're walking through this sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, and this week, obviously, we're talking about Patience. And what I wanted to do, what I want to do this morning is rather than us spending time talking about what patience is, I want us to talk about the difference between human patience and patience that's derived from the Spirit of God. And there has to be a qualitative difference between those two things. And so we're going to be in James chapter 5, verse 7 through 11. We're going to look at what is patience, we're going to look at what does it look like. And then what benefit is it? What good is Holy Spirit-inspired patience? So what is patience? So we're going to start in the back end of James, and a lot has already happened. James is one of, uh, if not the earliest book in the New Testament. Uh, James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he's writing to a group of Christians who are Jewish by birth, and they're scattered all throughout the Roman Empire. They're not in Palestine. And basically, James's book, particularly because it's so early, probably written in the 50s, is kind of a remix of Jesus' teachings, particularly the Sermon on the Mount. And so James closes this letter by calling back to what he wrote in the beginning, which is, you need to be patient in a time of suffering. Look at verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. Now, the reason why he's emphasizing patience is because these Jewish Christians are struggling really, really hard. He's just spent a lot of time talking about how the wealthy, both in the church and outside the church, are using their wealth to bring difficulty and oppression on those who are poor. And then those who are poor are looking at the wealthy and thinking, well, if I could just get wealthy, things would be okay. So there's envy, there's injustice going on. And James's solution to all of this is, it's going to be okay. Just be patient. Just wait. Everything's going to work out okay. Now I want you to think about a time in your life where things have been difficult for you. Maybe things have been hard. Maybe you had a friend that was walking through a difficult time. What is like the worst thing you can say to somebody? It'll get better. It's just you wait till tomorrow. It'll be fine. You break into a little Annie, the sun will come out tomorrow. It's like the worst thing you can say. And then James goes on to what I feel like compound what seems on the surface to be a pretty flimsy encouragement until the coming of the Lord. Well, now in our day, like 2,000 years after this was written, we're kind of like, that seems like a really long time. Seems like a really long time to be patient. Now, Christians back in those days believed that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. But that's still a really long, unknown time to wait. Now, we know that the word of God is encouraging. We know that it's meant to edify and build us up. So there has to be something more to this than that. Has to be something more. And look what he goes on to say. See how the farmer waits 
for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. He points us to a farmer. If you're a farmer, it takes a really long time to get a crop. This week, our fruit of patience, the patient fruit, not the passion fruit, is the pineapple. Pineapples take a really long time to grow. This one apparently was growing a little to the right. Jeff got the straight pineapple, I got the, this one. The pineapple takes two to three years to grow. Two to three years to get this. And to get into it, you can't really bite into it, right? I mean, I guess you could try, but it's not going to be a pleasant experience. You got to cut it up. It takes time to get after it. What's more, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody I'm sure will, but from what I read, not only does it take two to three years to get this fruit, the pineapple plant that produces this fruit, guess how many of these it makes? One. And it dies. You wait two to three years, you get this, and then it's done. But have you tasted a pineapple? They're amazing. They're incredible. They're like my favorite fruit. They're so good. It's worth the wait. And this is what Christian patience, patience derived from the Holy Spirit, really is. It's not waiting for difficulty to be over. It's not waiting for the suffering to pass. It's not surviving sort of intact. It's not waiting for that person who absolutely drives you crazy to leave the room. It's more than this. It's waiting for a goal. It's waiting for something to happen. It's waiting for the fruit of redemption and restoration and flourishing to take place in your life no matter how long it takes. It's enduring pain, it's enduring suffering, it's enduring setback and hardship and pandemics and annoying things and political divisiveness. It's enduring all of that, waiting on the fruit of restoration. That's why James says, until the coming of the Lord. When I say until, in our language, most of us think of that as a time marker, right? I'm going to wait until the service is over. By the way, we're going 15 minutes late to work on your patience. I'm just kidding. I'm going to wait until this service is over and then I'm going to do this. It's a time marker. But that's not all that until stands for. Until is also a goal. If I tell you that I'm going to run 26.2 miles, I am telling you both a distance and a goal. The goal is to run a marathon. I won't do that. If I tell you that I'm going to wait in a waiting room until the doctor calls me back, I'm telling you of a time length and a goal. I want the doctor to come and see me or me to go see the doctor. So when James says, until the coming of the Lord, what he's saying is, that is both a marker of time, which is unknown to us, but it's also a goal. We're going to keep our faith. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep persevering. And we're going to keep thriving and, and flourishing and bringing about restoration to other people until the Lord comes back. Christ's return, it's the pineapple. It takes a long time to get here, seemingly. It's a lot of difficult waiting. But man, when we get there, is it sweet? Is it sweet? And many of you are waiting through a difficult time right now and say a lot of us are, all of us are. Patience is hard, it's difficult. Aristotle said, patience is bitter, but the fruit is sweet. And while it is a bitter wait, there is hope, there is joy that comes in the midst of it. Do not lose your faith as you wait until the coming of the Lord because that's not just a time period, it's a goal. We're gonna stay faithful until he returns. Now the last phrase that he says there in verse 7, until it receives the early and the late rains. This is a callback to the Old Testament. The early and the late rains were a sign of God's faithfulness. God is faithful to bring about the rains needed to produce the fruit, the crops, right? Whatever we're waiting on, whatever we're patiently waiting on, God is going to deliver, God is going to help us not just survive, not just persevere, but thrive and flourish and bring restoration into our lives in the midst of our waiting. Whatever you need patience for, whatever you're in the midst of, God is faithful. 
He doesn't just start to grow us and then walk away because it's taking too long or you're too difficult. That's not how he works. He's faithful. But I want to make this very clear. The until the coming of the Lord doesn't mean that there are not evidences of God's grace and the kingdom in our lives even today because we need fruit now. So in my household, when we get a pineapple, it's a big event. My wife is the one who cuts the pineapple and the reason is because she's the only one who has patience to put up with it. So usually when she cuts a pineapple, if we're all home, uh, inevitably this happens. She starts cutting in the kitchen, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if we have some sort of like weird hearing in our household, but myself and Hattie, my oldest daughter, will like flock to the kitchen gradually because she's cutting a pineapple, and that means there are pieces of pineapple to be had while she cuts. Now, my youngest daughter, Sophie, doesn't know what's going on, but she knows if everyone's migrating to the kitchen, it's usually a good sign that there is food to be had. And so we're all waiting there. Well, my wife is gracious and she gives pieces of pineapple to the three of us as she cuts. Now she stores most of it away in a Pyrex uh, container, but we do get pieces of it. That is how the Lord works. Most of the pineapple, a good chunk of the pineapple of Christ's return, of the good things that are happening there are stored away for his return. But there is still pieces of the pineapple to be had now. There's still sweet joy and enjoyment to have in a relationship with him. You don't have to just wait until then because God is a good God and as he cuts up the good things of his kingdom, he hands them out to his people and it tastes sweet. So patience is waiting for the Lord, yes, but it's waiting for something restorative, flourishing, good, gracious, redemptive to happen in the midst of an otherwise tragic situation, an undesired situation. That's what Christian patience is. That's what fruit of the spirit is patience is. So what does this look like? Like, What does this look like on my day-to-day life? What does patience look like? Look at verse 8. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, uh, as I was reading this, I thought to myself, what does it mean to establish your heart? Like if you set out and write some goals for the day and you're like, I'm going to establish my heart this week. You show that to anybody and they're going to tell you that goal is not concrete enough. What does that mean? What does it mean to establish hearts? Well, what I did was I went and looked up the other places in Scripture where that same word is being used. And it gives us four things that we can do or that we can identify in our life that can show us if the fruit of the Spirit of patience is being worked on our life. The first one is from Luke twenty two thirty two, and it's be consistent. Look at verse 32. Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he says, starting in verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that it might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen, establish your brothers. So Jesus is telling Peter, I want your heart to be strengthened so that you can strengthen others. Part of the Christian faith is persevering in your relationship with the Lord, despite difficulty, despite challenge. It's keeping your faith in the midst of difficult circumstances. Look, the world around us Although it is not bad, it is saturated with sin, death, and evil. And that has a way of wearing down both our patience and our faith. I got my brakes changed the other day. And the way brakes work, as I've understood it, I'm not a mechanic, uh, just as much as I'm not a pineapple farmer. The way the brakes work is as you stop your car, little pads clamp onto the wheels, right? And they, they stop your car. And as you do that, friction wears down the brake pads. And if you aren't good on that, they're going to wear down your brakes as well. Our faith kind of does that in our life. It kind of stops us from maybe going off the rails a bit, from losing hope, from losing the joy of our life. Our faith is designed to do that. And as you walk through life, the difficulty and the challenges of life have a way of wearing down the faith that you have. So we have to regularly return to the Lord to get those things checked. You don't go to get your brakes changed when your brakes stopped working, coasting into the mechanic shop, not able to stop. That's ridiculous. You look for the warning signs and then you do something about it. We need to be consistent in our faith. We need to persevere in our faith. Part of patience is being consistent. It's being the same. And the reason why we do this and the reason why it's a fruit of the Spirit is because the fruit of the Spirit evidences something about God's character. God is consistent. He does not change. 
It's one of the reasons why he's patient. He's able to be patient because he does not change. And so when we are patient, and by being patient, I mean when we are consistently patient, when we're even, we show that our God is consistently patient. We also need to encourage others. That's another way. Look at Acts 18, verse 23. Paul's returning from some missionary journeys. And it says, after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening or establishing all of the disciples. Now, Paul's going around encouraging the believers. And one of the clearest evidences that you have the patience of the Holy Spirit is that you are encouraging others. Because what is our natural tendency when other people are wearing our patience thin? It's not to encourage them. Let's face it, if it weren't for people, wouldn't patience be just a whole lot easier? <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah, I can do that. I would be the most patient person in the world if it wasn't for all the people on the road getting in my way on the way to work. I would be the most patient person in the world if my wife would just get on the same page with me when the things I want to do. I would be a lot more patient if my kids listened all the time I would be a lot more patient if I didn't work with incompetent coworkers. I don't work with them, of course. But I'm sure some of you do. I would be so much more patient. And our tendency when we run into people that try our patience is not to encourage them. It is to talk bad about them, to grumble about them. In fact, James talks about this. Go back to uh, chapter five, verse nine. It says, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Isn't that funny? It's like James knows what people do when they encounter difficult people. Supernatural patience isn't just tolerating somebody until they go away. Supernatural patience is encouraging that person despite the fact that they drive you crazy. This is why it's a fruit of the Spirit. This is why it evidences the character of God. Because let's face it, so many of the things that we do as human beings really probably should drive God crazy. But they don't. And here's why. He tells us in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is what God says about himself. I.e., God is patient. And he's encouraging to us and he loves us. And so encourage those around you. Our tendency is to just grumble about them. Be an encouragement to other people. Seek out the difficult people, the challenging people, the ones that people avoid at work. Seek them out. Build them up. Teach them. Instruct them. When your spouse is hurting, when your spouse is being difficult, don't seek a refuge from them. Be their refuge. When your children aren't listening, try a new tactic. Listen to them for a second. It's a tough one for me. When your coworkers are trying your patience, encourage them, build them up, help them. Do for them all the things that Christ has done for you. It seems really simple, but it's not. It's hard. And that's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. That's why it's not something we generate out of our nature. The other thing we need to do is we need to resist temptation. Resist temptation. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3.13. 1 Thessalonians 3.13. says, so that he may establish, it's that word again, your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That holiness and blameless sounds really daunting, right? Being blameless sounds really hard to do. The thing is, God is not calling you to be perfect, not in this particular scenario, not without fail. It's not what it means here. It means your identity. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and what that means is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and it means that you believe that when he came to earth, he lived a perfect life. And it means that you understand that you cannot have a perfect relationship with God. You can't even have a real good relationship with God except through Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection opens up a pathway for us. It opens up the pathway for us to have a relationship with God the Father. And the moment that you believe that, the moment you lay aside all of your attempts to make God happy and instead embrace the fact that Jesus is the only way to do that, you get declared righteous. Cosmically, supernaturally, you are now no longer 
guilty of your crimes, you are forgiven. Now, if you have lived any time on earth, you know that despite that declaration of righteousness, we still mess up and do things the wrong way. And so what the Holy Spirit does in our life is he begins to work to make us into what we have been declared to be. And so he keeps working, keeps working, keeps working. And this takes time. It takes patience. If you've ever struggled with sin, you know it takes patience to overcome that thing as the Spirit works in your life. And so we need to put ourselves in positions where the Spirit can work. We need to do things. We need to be faithful in the Word. We need to confess to other believers, spending time in prayer. We need to confess to God when we mess up. And that's hard because we think that God is sort of disgusted with us a lot of the time. We think that God's angry with us. Even if we're believers, we struggle with this idea that God really fully accepts me. And that brings us to the fourth evidence of patience. It's in 2 Thessalonians 6, 13, 16, 13. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them, there's that word again, in every good work and word. We need to rest in the love of Jesus Christ. Rest in the love of Jesus Christ. One of the things that I'm learning about, and I've been learning probably the biggest thing I've been learning for the past couple years is how much the Father loves me. How much he loves me and how much he accepts me because of Christ. When you go to God with your sin, with your brokenness, with your failings, with your mess ups, he doesn't turn his nose up to you. He wants you to come to him. He longs for you to come to him. He wants you to be the first person that you come and see. The moment that that act is committed that you're like, oh, that was a mistake. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. The first person he wants you to talk to is him. He loves you and wants to hear from you at all times. And we have a tendency to go to other things as, we, as our patience gets worn out. We have this tendency to go to other things, to sex, to material possessions, to substances, to all sorts of stuff. And in some cases, those things aren't bad. But they're quick fixes and they're easy fixes. And sometimes resting in the love of the Lord maybe it requires a little bit more patience than we have. That's why it's an evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. As we read in Psalm 40, right, I waited patiently on the Lord and he turned and he heard my cry. Turned and he heard my cry. That is what God wants to do for you. If you're a believer, he wants you to rest with him. If you're not a believer, guess what? Despite the fact that as you stand cosmically, you're God's enemy. But he wants to change that. If you would just come to him. Rest in his arms. Lay down your attempts to save yourself. So we've talked about what Christian patience is. We've talked about what it looks like. Let's talk about what benefit it is to us. What good is it to me? Because we live in a world, frankly, that's trying to get rid of the need for patience. The idea of waiting is seen as an obstacle to us. We want to live in a world where patience doesn't have a need anymore. We want to be like uh, writing messages on stone tablets. There's no need for that anymore. And if you can figure out a way to reduce the time that it takes somebody to do something, guess what? You make money in our culture. If you can figure out a way to get this pineapple to grow in a year rather than two, you're making bank, my friend. Waiting is almost seen as an evil in our life. But there's a benefit to it. There's benefit. And I see two that James talks about. Back in James chapter 5, 1, it gives us a platform. It gives us a platform. Look at verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, we don't know what prophets he's talking about here, but there's a good many to choose from. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, all of them suffered because of their message that they had. All of them suffered. And they didn't just suffer because of their message. They suffered because they spoke out against the suffering of other people. When we patiently endure our trials, our difficulties, our challenges, guess what happens? People notice if you are patiently enduring in a different way than everybody else is patiently enduring. Patiently enduring. When you are waiting for the Lord to do something redemptive, to do something amazing, flourishing, until the coming of the Lord, until he makes himself known, in whatever difficult circumstance you're in, when that's your goal, guess what? That creates a platform for you. 
We're in a season of time now where we talk a lot about platforms, right? What's his platform? What's their platform? What, what, what platform is the Republican Party? What platform is the Democratic Party? Can I offer you an encouragement during this season? As believers in Christ, we have been given a platform. And when I think of platform, I think of a raised, wooden sort of place to stand so you can make proclamations. Our platform as believers was made out of the wooden, blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. In his death and his resurrection, he took that cross and he laid it on the ground and he gave you a firm place to stand from which you can make, you can oppose oppression, you can fight against evil, you can rest in comfort and patience as we wait for him to come back and make everything right and good again. Don't trade a, a platform that is so good and holy and righteous as the cross of Jesus Christ for a party platform. Don't do that. Don't do it because the firm foundation of Jesus Christ's cross is so much greater than any politician's platform, no matter what letter appears after their name on screen. So it gives us a platform. It also gives us a purpose. Look at verse 11. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Some of y'all know the story of Job. The story of Job is this. One day Job was sitting there and he's like, I need to be more patient. So he prayed for patience and God was like, finally, I've been wanting to make him more patient. So I'm gonna take all of his stuff, take his clothes, take his house, take his kids, and I'm gonna take his health. Because Job pr pr prayed for patience. That's not how the story goes at all, is it? I always think it's funny when people are like, oh, don't pray for patience. Because God's gonna give it to you. Like God has like this horde of traffic jams. He's just waiting to pour out on you, but he can't. Because you won't pray for patience. No, the story of Job is this. Job was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was righteous and upright. He was committed to the Lord. He was waiting for the Lord. And God allowed things to happen to him, suffering to happen to him, bad things to happen to him. And notice what James says. We've all heard of his steadfastness, his patience. And, then, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. James is talking about Job. Nobody thinks of Job and think, wow, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. The man has boils all over him. His kids die. He loses everything. If you're going to do a Bible study on the compassion and mercy of the Lord, Job is not typically the place most people start. But James says, mm -mm. we have a purpose. Everything that happens to us, everything that tries our patience is an opportunity to enact that purpose in our life, which is to show that our God is compassionate and merciful. So when something happens to you that not only tries your patience, but maybe obliterates it, lays you low, crushes your spirit, our response from the platform that we have as followers of Jesus Christ is despite what I am feeling, despite what I am experiencing, God is compassionate and he's merciful. Terminal diagnosis, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Loss of a loved one, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Debilitating illness, compassionate and merciful. Your candidate on November whatever doesn't win, compassionate and merciful. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. And this is our purpose in life as believers, as the people of God, is to show the world that no matter what happens, we are patiently waiting. And we're patiently waiting for our Lord to return. And that's going to be evidenced in our life. It's going to be shown by being consistent by being encouraging, by resisting alternatives to patience. We're not going to uh, take a shortcut and we're going to rest in the love and grace of our Lord. And while we do that, we're going to have a platform to speak out. And all of that, all of that wrapped together is going to be our purpose, not just for having patience. It's going to be our purpose for living. And so we will proclaim the good news of Christ's death, his restorative purposes, even for the death of his son, even that had redemptive purposes, the greatest redemptive purpose of all time, the death of the most righteous man ever, redeemed us. And so we be patient. What is patience? It's waiting on the goodness of the Lord. How do we evidence it? 
We show it by being consistent, by encouraging others, by resisting temptation, and by resting in the love and grace of our Lord. It gives us a platform and it gives us a purpose. I hope that this week, that as things try your patience, you will not try to struggle through it on your own, but instead will cry out to the Lord, Lord, bear the fruit of patience in my life. And Lord, may I see the good fruit that you'll bear out of it. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, there are many things that try our patience in our day and age today. There are many things that wear us down. There's many things that make us want to just try another path. Holy Spirit, I ask that in your grace, you would fill us with your, you would evidence our, your, your patience. You would have us bear the patience, the patience of our Savior that waited 30 years in a sinful world to go to the cross and endure six hours of suffocation to rescue his people. And I pray that we would have the same patience, not just the patience of Job, the patience of Christ. May you manifest it in us so that the world may know where our hope is and may it be redeemed. May those around us be redeemed through our patience. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.